For the next 30 minutes, we are going to be discussing the ins and outs of fencing and boundary laws in the state of Missouri. And for the next five seconds, you're going to decide whether or not you want to be a part of that. Let's get into it. Missouri's landscape is dotted with farms and rural properties where clear boundaries are crucial. No one wants their farm invaded by cattle or crops they don't own, and you probably wouldn't like someone stepping foot onto your property without permission either. So landowners often put up fences to mark these boundaries and provide security, privacy, noise reduction, or even decoration. But you can't just throw a fence up between you and your neighbor's property willy-nilly. Missouri is a place of law. And here, fence regulations are primarily governed by Revised Statute Section 272, which seeks to put a fence around how fences work in the Show Me State, a matter that has continued to challenge us for over 200 years. The first fencing laws were established in 1808, when Missouri was still a part of the Louisiana Purchase, and since that time, Missourians have learned a lot about how the whole fence business should work, so much so that Missouri Missouri's fencing statute has undergone more revisions than you can shake a fence post at, including updates in 1909, 1919, 1929, and 1939, where Section 272 was officially codified then amended in 1945, likely reflecting changes in agricultural practice post-World War II. 1963 and 1965 saw significant updates, mainly establishing firm legal definitions so that lawyers had something to play with. 1978 further adjusted verbiage for evolving legal interpretations. In 2001, the law went through a major overhaul as Missouri had grown to have more urban areas and thus different needs needed to be addressed. 2013 and 2016 then introduced amendments that lessened penalties fence owners would face for certain infractions. The point is, and I cannot overstate this enough, by the time you watch this video, the laws about fences will probably have changed to something completely different. Let's start with the fundamentals. What is a fence? According to Missouri's revised statute section 272, a lawful fence is any fence consisting of posts and wire or boards at least four feet high, which is mutually agreed upon by adjoining landowners or decided upon by the associate circuit court of the county. All posts shall be set firmly in the ground, not more than 12 feet apart with wire or boards securely fastened to such posts and placed at proper distances apart to resist horses, cattle, and other similar livestock. The key phrases to remember are at least four feet high, with posts not more than 12 feet apart. It certainly never hurts to exceed the medium requirements in the unfortunate event that some over-scrupulous neighbor or bureaucratic official shows up on your property with a yardstick. The other key thing to remember is that your fence must be strong enough to resist livestock. You have no idea just how many cases flood the Missouri court every year because Farmer Bill's cows got into Farmer Ted's grass, not because Bill's cows are bovine sociopaths, but because Ted didn't hammer his fence posts down hard enough. Now that you know what a fence is, I'm going to spend the next few minutes making it completely confusing by telling you that Missouri fence law has become so complicated it now recognizes two different kinds of fences and two different sets sets of laws about fences, though the two different sets of laws both apply to the different kinds of fences in different contexts. Exterior Fences and Division Fences Exterior fences are fences along public roads or boundaries with rivers and creeks. These are the fences that keep your cows from getting out in public. Exterior fences are good because sometimes you have a dog named Gwen who likes to run out into the street and needs a physical fence capable of withstanding the force of a cow to keep her from causing traffic congestion. Division fences, on the other hand, are those that separate different properties of different lands 
landowners. This is the fence that keeps Farmer Ted's land separated from Farmer Bill's. Division fences are good because sometimes Farmer Bill's cows happen to catch beef with Farmer Ted's. These two different fences could be governed by two different laws, the general fence law or the local option fence law. You see, Missourians eventually figured out that fence laws are rarely one size fits all. Sometimes a standard set of rules and regulations can be a good thing, but sometimes you are three farming families from St. Clair, Missouri, and there's this one awkward patch of land that the fence constantly falls over in because the ground gets super soft whenever a storm rolls through, and rather than spend all day combing through Missouri statutes to see whose responsibility it is to repair this month based on which direction the wind happened to blow during the storm, you'd rather just make your own set of rules to use for your own community instead of making sure that you're doing the same thing that they do over in Clinton County. So while most towns do operate under Missouri's general fence law, some communities, as of this video, the counties of Bates, Cedar, Clinton, Davies, Gentry, Grundy, Harrison, Knox, Lynn, Macon, Mercer, Newton, Putnam, Schuyler, Scotland, Shelby, St. Clair, Sullivan, and Worth have their own local fence laws. If you are a Missourian, it is important to know which law your particular community is under. And while I would love to stand here and spend the next several minutes telling you each and every town's specific local stipulations, they change more often than the state's general law does. But for those curious, they tend to address nuances like rules around barbed wire and electrically charged fences, peculiar zoning laws, including peculiar zoning laws, size stipulations when around or near government buildings, and who is responsible for picking up brush in the immediate vicinity around the fence, or if brush is required to be picked up at all, it's thrilling stuff. For now, we will just focus on Missouri's general fence law, as it relates to Missouri's revised statute section 272. As discussed previously, under general law, a lawful fence must meet certain height and construction criteria to contain livestock effectively. But whenever disputes arise, such as over costs or maintenance responsibilities, section 272 offers mechanisms for resolution. Like subsection 0 which states, if any horses, cattle, or other stock shall break over or through any lawful fence, and by so doing obtain access to or do trespass upon the premises of another, the owner of such animal shall be liable for any damages sustained if the owner of the trespassing horses, cattle, or other stock was negligent. If Farmer Bill's heifer manages to break down the fence and damage Farmer Ted's crops, and Farmer Bill was aware of weaknesses or damage in the boundary fence that made it easier for his heifer to escape, yet did not take steps to repair it or notify Farmer Ted of the issue, Farmer Bill's inaction could be seen as negligence, making him responsible for the ensuing damage. By the same token, it could be proven that Farmer Ted was responsible for the weakened fence. Perhaps a tree on Ted's property fell over and he failed to address the hazard or warn Bill about it. In that instance, Farmer Ted could be found negligent and thus responsible for the resulting damage himself. If you think these scenarios don't happen, they do. Okay, so what happens if Farmer Bill and Farmer Ted get into an argument about some fence malfunction? According to Section 272, Subsection 040, upon complaint of either party claiming to be injured because of the trespass or taking up of livestock as described in the previous section, the Associate Circuit Judge shall, without delay, issue an order to three disinterested householders of the neighborhood, not of kin to either party, reciting the complaint and requiring them to view the fence where the trespass is complained of and take memoranda of the same, and appear before the court on the day set for trial, and their evidence shall determine the lawfulness of such fence. Farmer Bill's bovine gained access to Farmer Ted's farm when the fence separating them fell down. Ted wants compensation for his damaged crops, but Bill claims that the fence fell because of Ted's own neglect. They go to a judge. 
The judge must, without delay, select three people in the neighborhood who aren't related to Bill or Ted and who have no preference for either man to form a three-person committee. These three people are given power by the court to go to the fence in question, inspect it from both sides, take pictures, and make notes about what they see. The three then go back to the court and report their findings to the judge. The judge then uses their recommendation to determine whether Bill or Ted are responsible. This is an actual law. But don't worry, according to 040, the persons appointed by the associate circuit judge shall be paid $25 each day for the time actually employed, which shall be taxed as costs in the case equally against the parties and collected accordingly. But what if crops aren't the only thing damaged? What if livestock is? See subsection 050. If any person who does not maintain a sufficient fence shall hurt, wound, lame, kill, or destroy, or cause the same to be done by shooting, worrying with dogs, or otherwise any of the animals in this chapter mentioned, such persons shall satisfy the owner in double damages with costs. Farmer Bill shoots Farmer Ted's cow for stepping onto his property. Yet the court determines Farmer Bill's own neglect of the fence caused Farmer Ted's cow to wander over in the first place. Farmer Bill must pay Farmer Ted double whatever the court then determines the late cow was worth. Subsection 060. Whenever the owner of real estate desires to construct or repair a lawful fence which divides his or her land from that of another, such owner shall give Give written notice of such intention to the adjoining landowner. The landowners shall meet, and each shall construct or repair that portion of the division fence which is on the right of each owner as the owners face the fence line while standing at the center of their common property line on their own property. If the owners cannot agree as to the part each shall construct or keep in repair, either of them may apply to an associate circuit judge of the county who shall forthwith summon three disinterested households of the township or county to appear on the premises, giving three days' notice to each of the parties of the time and place where such viewers shall meet, and such viewers shall, under oath, designate the portion to be constructed or kept in repair by each of the parties interested and notify them in writing of the same. Such viewers shall receive $25 each per day for the time actually employed, which shall be taxed as court costs. Farmer Ted writes a letter to Farmer Bill saying he wants to fix the the fence and suggests they split the labor and cost. Bill and Ted meet one Saturday morning at the fence and stand in the middle of their shared property line facing each other. Bill looks to his right, Ted looks to his. Each man is responsible for that section of the fence. This procedure is called the right hand rule. And before you ask, nobody knows where it originated, but let's just say for the sake of argument that Bill doesn't like the arrangement. Maybe he notices the fence to his right is way more damaged than the one on Ted's right and thus will cost more, so he refuses, maybe claiming that Ted should fix the whole thing, since his trees along the fence are the ones causing the most damage in the first place. They go to an increasingly annoyed local judge who, as before, creates a committee of three to look at the fence and offer their recommendation, each getting the $25 as before paid out by the court costs due from either Ted or Bill or both. The right-hand rule assumes each neighbor has livestock against the division fence. If not, then the neighbor with livestock has to build and maintain the whole fence on their own. Except, of course, in the instance of subsection 060 sub subsection 2, which states, existing agreements not consistent with the right-hand rule shall be in writing, signed by the agreeing parties, and shall be recorded in the office of the recorder of deeds in the county or counties where the fence line is located. The agreement shall bind the makers, their heirs, and a signs. But what if one of the neighbors fails to uphold their end of that agreement? Subsection 070. If either party fails to construct or repair his or her portion of the fence in accordance with the provisions of 272.060 within a reasonable time, the other may petition the associate circuit court of the county to authorize the petitioner to build or repair the fence in a manner to be directed by the court. If the court authorizes such action, the 
petitioner shall be given a judgment for that portion of the total cost of the fence which is chargeable as the other party's portion of the fence, court costs, and reasonable attorney's fees. Farmer Bill drags his feet and won't pay for his part of the fence. After several months, Farmer Ted's part of the fence has been fixed, but Bill's remains untouched, leaving a gap that allows Ted's dog to escape onto Bill's property, causing problems. Farmer Ted can petition the court and, with the court's approval, finish the fence himself and the court will put a lien on Bill's property until he reimburses Ted the cost of the repair, plus the inevitable attorney's fees. If Farmer Ted is smart, he will make sure to use the most expensive building materials possible. Subsections 080090 and 100 are all about codifying the various legalities of collecting and distributing money from the previous hypotheticals. Subsection 110 states that every person owning a part of a division fence is responsible for keeping his or her portion in good repair and also grants them the right to enter upon any land lying adjacent to the fence for the purpose of carrying this responsibility out. Yes, Farmer Ted, Farmer Bill can step one foot and indeed several feet onto your property so long as he's fixing the fence. Subsection 120 says that division fences cannot be removed without the consent of all the owners, unless for the purpose of opening a public road or highway. If Farmer Bill or Farmer Ted tears the fence down without getting permission, they must pay the other party double the cost of the fence. Subsection 130 is basically the do-over clause. Let's say Farmer Bill is ordered by a judge to pay for a fence in our previous hypotheticals, but he feels that judgment was unjust. Maybe he feels Farmer Ted lied to the judge about the conditions on his side of the fence. Maybe he feels that three-person committee had a secret grudge against him. Or maybe evidence comes to light that one of those court-appointed investigators happened to be Ted's second cousin twice removed. <gasps> he can then challenge the associate circuit judge's decision. The review process treats the challenge as it would any other civil action. This means the case is re-examined, allowing Bill to present additional evidence or arguments to support his claim that the repair costs should not be divided as initially ruled. The court looks at the new evidence, considers the new arguments, and evaluates whether the original decision followed legal standards and procedures. Remember when I said only the landowner with livestock has to pay for the fence? Subsection 132 says that this price must be recorded on a deed. And in the event that the owner without livestock decides to get livestock later, the landowner that built the fence will then be reimbursed for one half of the original construction price. Farmer Bill has no livestock. You you get the point. Subsection 134 is a fun one. Nothing prevents adjoining landowners from agreeing that no fence is needed between their property, though <laughs> good luck with that. Subsection 136, there's nothing in these rules that says you can't exceed the fence's minimum dimensional requirements. The next few subsections are just general housekeeping things, defining terms and whatnot. Subsection 240 gives us insight into the general time timetable of the whole enterprise. If one landowner wants to build a fence, they have to notify their neighbor in writing so that they can do the whole right-hand routine. If, within 90 days after receiving that letter, the neighbor still hasn't helped build their half, the other landowner can officially petition the court, at which point a judge looks at the evidence and decides whether or not that neighbor has to actually pay, because after all, maybe that neighbor doesn't want a fence, can't afford a fence, or doesn't need it. Also, hey, by the way, no owner shall be required to pay more than one half the value of a lawful fence of four barbed wires, regardless of the type fence constructed. This is an important part of the law because sometimes you get into the fun situation where two neighboring landowners can't quite agree on what kind of fence they want to have. There are, after all, several different options to choose from in this day and age, and the different options cost different amounts. You don't want to get stuck in a situation where your neighbor requests a top-of-the-line deluxe fence that you can't pay for. Subsection 250, if the parties can't decide on how much
much the fence will cost, the judge orders our old friends but not their friends committee of three to appraise it. 272.260. If the person thus assessed or charged with the value of one half of any fence under the provisions of section 272.210 to 272.370 shall neglect or refuse to pay over to the owner of the fence the amount so awarded, the same may be recovered before a court of competent jurisdiction. Subsection 270 is the one where the law basically says, hey, if Farmer Bill and Farmer Ted want to just write up their own agreement, go for it. It gets signed and sent to the office of the recorder of deeds in their county, making it a binding agreement for themselves and any future owners of the properties, so that disputes may continue for a millennia. Subsection 280 is the what happens if that agreement gets broken section, where the law states that a judge will again appoint three disinterested people for a committee, but then hilariously basically gives that committee total jurisdiction. It is to not bother the judge about this fence any further. They just have to write letters to each of the landowners informing them what the committee's final decision is. Subsection 290 is the special partition fence section. Let's say Farmer Bill decides he wants to raise sheep, pigs, or other animals that require specialized fences. This provision protects Farmer Ted from being overcharged for a fence with extra costs that he will not benefit from. Instead, he just reimburses Bill the cost of what a regular fence would have been, unless of course he decides to then get some sheep of his own and will benefit from these added features, in which case he must pay half of the final cost. Subsection 300 clarifies that the three-person committee of subsection 250 and 280 will only be paid $5 a piece per day for their time. I don't know why the amount is less. 310, 320, and 330 are all basically legalese subsections that equate the terms division fence and partition fence in case Farmer Bill or Farmer Ted decide to hire a lawyer looking for semantic loopholes. 340 and 350 allows Farmer Bill and Farmer Ted to appeal to the circuit court if they still don't want to just pay for the stupid fence. 360 covers whenever these laws are up for public vote and allows them to be changed by a majority of voting citizens, and 370 states that by petition of 100 real estate owners of 10 acres or more in the county, the city may submit to the voters at a general or special election a proposal for changes to anything in Section 272. And that, in so many words, is an explanation of Missouri's fencing laws. For farmers! What about all the weird non-farming fence stuff? Well, there are plenty of regulations to be had. You see, fences exist for a variety of purposes outside of maintaining agriculture. Check out section 67.301 for extended rules regarding battery-charged electric fences throughout Missouri, lumber yard regulations in chapter 77 subsection 510, 79.400 outlines the Board of Aldermen's powers concerning fence law in regards to animals and poultry. 190.265 prevents laws from being passed that would require fences on helipads and hospital roofs. 214.131 makes it a class A misdemeanor to destroy or mutilate any fences in abandoned family or private cemeteries. 217.141 allows the Department of Corrections to install high voltage electrified security fence systems at all existing and proposed maximum or medium security correctional centers. 226.720 prohibits junkyards from being operated within 200 feet of any state or county road unless the junkyard is fully covered by a screen fence not less than 10 feet high or of sufficient height to fully screen the wrecked or disabled automobiles or junk kept therein from the view of persons using the state or county road on foot or in vehicles in the ordinary manner 
except that nothing in this section shall apply to any junkyard located in any incorporated town, village, or city. 242.190 and 245.095 and 249.290 allows the removal of fences by state officials for the purpose of land drainage, protection, reclamation, as well as installation of sewer systems. 253.175 is a specialty subsection regarding fences coinciding with the boundary between individual landowner property and the portion of the historic Missouri Rock Island Railroad Corridor owned, leased, or operated by the Division of State Parks, and states that such fences shall be maintained by the Division of State Parks within the Department of Natural Resources. 270.060 is good to know. It shall not be necessary for any person to fence against any of the domestic animals enumerated in the chapter, but this doesn't mean railroads get off scot-free. 270.260, any person who recklessly or knowingly releases any swine to live in a wild or feral state upon any public land or private land not completely enclosed by a fence capable of containing such animals is guilty of a Class A misdemeanor and may be sentenced to pay a fine up to $2,000. And to show just how serious about this provision they are, each swine so released shall be a separate offense. 271.010 is a charmingly specific provision that prevents your neighbor from calling your dog that broke through their fence a stray animal and then taking it in against your wishes. And if it happens to be an unbroken animal, like say a horse, no person shall take up a stray unbroken animal between the first day of April and the first day of November. 293.530 says abandoned underground mines must be sealed or fenced by owners in such a way that protects the general public. At this point, I know that many of you are asking to know more about the specific provisions and regulations of fences throughout different railroads in Missouri, and 389.650, 488.470, 537.260, and 537.270 are all about the responsibility of railroads as it pertains to fences on their property, including obligations of railroad companies to construct and maintain fences along their tracks to prevent livestock from wandering onto rail lines, protecting both the livestock and the safety of train operations, handling cases of trespassing or damages to property or animals, and of course rules for handling court costs and fees in the associated civil proceedings should the laws not be followed. 537.350 covers what happens if Bill and Ted's fence has a gate on it and Ted leaves it open on accident, letting Bill's livestock in, which Wait a minute, which one had animals again? Anyway, whoever accidentally left the gate on the fence open has to pay double damages. Plus, for some reason, an extra five bucks. I feel like like there's a story there. Who can really tell? That law, like many, was written in the 1930s. Of course, not covered in state law are things like local building codes, zoning laws, and neighborhood association rules, which of course can vary significantly from one municipality to another. These local regulations often provide detailed requirements for fences in residential areas, including those not used for farming or containing livestock. Here's the point. When it comes to fence law, there is a lot of misinformation out there. For example, you have probably heard your entire life that when determining who is responsible for a fence, things like whichever side the posts are on is the owner. But that is not always the case. Please stop perpetuating that myth. The best way to determine who the owner of a fence is in residential areas is to examine the actual legal documents regarding the properties. If needed, then get a property survey by a licensed professional surveyor and always consult local zoning laws and city ordinance to ensure that you are building or repairing fences the right way. And in rural areas like farms, it seems to me that there are a few best practices. Number one, if you have a fence, check your fence regularly for issues. Doing so goes a long way to avoiding potential problems. Number two, if issues arise, communicate with your 
your neighbor. Make sure everyone's on the same page about what's happening at the fence line. Treat them how you would like to be treated if the shoe were on the other foot. And number three, when repairing or building a fence on a farm, whether you observe the general state law or some kind of local option, or you just decide to work it out privately between you and your neighbor, get it put down in writing. Have all parties involved sign it and record it against the land title at the county recorder's office. Because in the state of Missouri, verbal agreements dealing with land must always be in writing to be enforceable in court or to be binding on heirs or future owners of the property. Above all, learn from Bill and Ted. Don't fight and fuss about your fences. Instead, be excellent to each other. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website. Start the process with Squarespace Blueprint, their new guided design system. Answer simple questions about what you want your site to be, then choose from a slew of beautiful layout and styling options that you can customize however you want. If you've got an idea for a podcast, their audio blocks feature makes setting one up a total breeze, and if you've got stuff to sell, their online storefront takes the headache out of processing payments. Head to squarespace.com to start a free trial today. Then when you're ready to launch your site in full, head over to squarespace.com slash Austin McConnell to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.